this week's Eccentric Minute, brought to you by Eccentric. In this week's Eccentric Minute, we'll discuss another one of our foundational exercises, and that is the K-Pulley Leg Drive. To execute this, you're going to need to set some sort of support right out in front of you where you're going to be about under your shoulders and allowing your body to extend out at a 45 degree angle. From here, you're going to let your hips sink straight back towards the K-Pulley, and I want you to push as hard as you can with your feet to drive your shoulders up and out at a 45 degree angle by extending your hip, knees, and ankles. This is a great exercise to start training your athletes to be up off their heels and to drive through the ball of their feet and their big toe as we move forward in training. Give this one a shot, guys. I think this is one that you're going to love and your athletes are really going to enjoy. I really hope you enjoyed this week's Eccentric Minute. Make sure you check them out at eccentric.com to find out everything you need about the K-Box and the K-Pulley. Being a strength and conditioning professional requires constant pursuit of better knowledge, better methods, and better means. But what if there was a place where strength and conditioning coaches could learn from some of the most innovative practitioners in the world, such as Jeff Moyer, Lachlan Wilmot, William Wayland, James the Thinker Smith, and Kirwenham Flat? Well, you could find multiple lectures from each of these top-level coaches and a few lectures and examples from yours truly as well, all in the Strength Coach Network. The Strength Coach Network is going to bring you well over 100 different lectures from some of the top practitioners in the world to be your one-stop shop for your continuing education and professional development. So hop on over to strengthcoachnetwork.com slash today and get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. That's strengthcoachnetwork.com slash C-V-A-S-P-S to get your 48-hour trial for only a dollar. I look forward to seeing you in the Strength Coach Network. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, I have the absolute pleasure of sitting down with the Performance Nutrition Lead for Canada Basketball, Dr. Mark Bubbs, to discuss how we can keep our athletes healthy and fueled properly. After a real brief intro, we're going to dive right into what the primary goals are that Dr. Bubbs has with working with the men of Canada basketball. Then he gets right into the pillars of their nutrition program, and this includes the impact of processed foods, meal timing, and different ways that we can work with our athletes to make sure that they make better nutritional decisions. He then shares with us the idea of, uh, of social jet lag. And how athletes like of different ages may not be best suited for early mornings. And, and some things that we should consider as coaches when we're looking at both scheduling of training and fueling for our athletes. This is really an awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Doc, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. Awesome, bud. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm fired up for this. Anytime I can get here and rap about high level ball I, I get pretty fired up but for the three quarters of a human being who doesn't know who you are let, let's let them know you know where you're at what you're getting into and, and what you got cooking doc yeah i'm, I'm the uh, performance nutrition lead with canada basketball so working up in toronto canada i have a background in uh, naturopathic medicine and so we just came off the world cup in china so we had a big build up for our guys and uh you know, as we were talking about beforehand, great experience going over there in China, great teammates, great performance staff, a lot of things we implemented, unfortunately fell a bit short. And so, you know, this is where, uh, this is sport, right? This is like, you, you saddle up, you bring your best guys and then you see how well you can do. And as performance staff, we just try to support our guys. And, you know, for me on the nutrition side, when you get into some of those big travels, you know, we went from Toronto to Sydney, Australia, and then up into China, you know, you get some heavy duty travel, guys can get sick. And then, you know, the, the schedule when you play these types of tournaments is pretty intense too. You're playing a game every other night. So there's a lot of things to think about uh, from the nutrition side. Yeah. And uh, that's a long flight from Toronto to Australia. It's pretty much the first, I mean, the, uh, the guys flew from Winnipeg to Sydney and then on to Perth, which I don't know if you can go any further <laughs> on the planet. So the air miles were looking good, but the guys were feeling, um, you know, not the greatest. Although, you know, we did have a jet lag strategy in place. So, you know, we let them know when they should be staying up and when they should be trying to get some sleep. And, you know, thankfully the guys 
the guys uh, got into it a little bit and, 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 and adhered to it. And all things considered, you know, felt as good as they could when they got there. But it's definitely, you know, 12 hour time change. It's, t- it's tough to hit the ground running when you get there. So then let's talk about your role a little bit there because, you know, yeah. obviously the nutrition aspect is vital. But then when you tie in the medicine background, let's talk about how those two work together and then For sure. building that out and how you're working with these young men to help them fuel even better. Yeah, I mean, I think for me with the with the medical background, it's, you know, the athlete health part of it really becomes a, a, a key a component of the philosophy for me. I mean, especially in a skill-based sport, as you know, you know, some players naturally are going to have high skill and natural gifts in terms of speed or leaping ability, et cetera. And so it's, it's not like an endurance sport where we can just, you know, calculate how fast they need to go, calculate the energy required, put it in the system and then off you go, right? There's a lot of uh, nuance, a lot of complexity. And so keeping athletes healthy is a huge part of this whole story. And, you know, especially young athletes, whether they're high school, college, you know, if you're frequently fatigued, run down, you know, symptoms of things like colds or flu, you're going to be missing practices and missing games, missing training sessions. And the research is pretty clear, you know, elite performance is, is incompatible with frequent illness. And so, you know, being healthy is a key c- component of this. We know that, you know, as training load and intensity goes up, then, you know, you, the likelihood of, of getting sick also increases. We know that as, as sleep time goes down, which tends to do, you know, high school athletes, collegiate athletes, and also increases your risk of, of, of illness. And so that's a big first pillar is how do we keep these, these young athletes and, and professional athletes even healthy? And so, you know, things like obviously sleep are, are key, things like maintaining that health so the immune system is robust and the guys can bounce back. And, you know, you're going to catch colds and flus, but you want to be able to bounce, bounce back effectively. And so there's things, there's fundamentals that the guys need to have in place to be able to to tr- you know, not get sick so frequently, and then you know, if, if people do, you know, catch colds, which they will do in, in different scenarios, then we've got some strategies on board that we can help you know implement to help them get back in action as quick as they can. But uh, that's that's definitely a huge baseline is that you know human first sort of philosophy of, of keeping them healthy as people. And one of the areas to give you an example is, is that we've probably done some work in, and that people tend to send athletes over is around that digestive side of things. So oftentimes athletes will have, you know, those fundamentals in place of getting in the calories or the carbohydrates or whatever it might be, but there's, you know, bloating and discomfort or constant congestion or, or sickness. And so that's when, you know, the art of the practice comes into, into play and you got to figure out then what, what the best foods are for that athlete. So let's take a step back. You know, the athlete first approach is something that Charlie's talked about forever and he spoke about here at CVASPS quite passionately. Uh, so I always nice. got to give a shout out to, to Dr. Weingrop because Charlie, Charlie's a stud. But yeah, I absolutely. think that one of the things that people, and we were talking about this a little bit before, kind of have a little bit of fake confusion about are those pillars. So I guess the question I have for you is, is it as simple as like an apple a day keeps the doctor away? Well, I mean, it's a great question. And it's one that we, depending on the athlete or even general population, the client that we're working with, you know, do we want to use kind of simple rules and heuristics or do we want to get really detailed with the prescription? And I think a great simple rule or, a, you know, an example to illustrate this is that you know, in Canada, in the U.S., and in the U.K., 50% of household spending is on ultra-processed food, so stuff that comes in boxes and bags, right? Half of the grocery bill at home comes from that. Now, I'm over here in London at the moment, and if I were to get on a train and go to Paris, which is only about an hour and a half away by train, all of a sudden you step outside the train station, and 14% of household spending is on ultra-processed food, right? And so it's this amazing thing of if we can just – Eat more real food, right? One of the secrets of the Mediterranean diet, which, you know, in medicine they love, even though there's quite a few countries in the Mediterranean, so there really is no one diet. Um, but all these countries are, are eating real food. You know, they're, they're cooking from scratch. They're eating lots of uh, healthy sources of, of animal protein and lots of vegetables, et cetera. So when you ask pros how to eat well, and even 
pros at the highest level, you know, still need to learn how to eat well, even if they're all the way in the NBA, right? The lessons we're teaching is, is still on the fundamental side of things. And so that's a big part of it. If we can do that well, you know, then we're going to at least be, it's going to be much easier to get on board uh, the fuel that we want. And then, you know, the, the nuance then comes with, you know, basketball is an intense game, right? The physical demands are high. Um, you know, a lot of high intensity efforts change the direction. And so we're going to need a certain amount of energy and calories. And that's where then, whether it's juices, supplements, other types of foods that potentially most likely need to be a, uh, added to the mix, that's where, uh, you know, that's where we need to go to make sure that the guys are getting all the energy they need to, to recover and to be prepared to play the next day. Yeah, you know, I think that that's awesome to hear because I think that the, especially the college kids really love to go for the quick fix instead of going to the dining hall and actually taking the things that actually look closest to what they look like when they're in nature. Yeah, and I mean, the benefit, too, of the dining hall is that these set feeding times is a, is a pretty good thing because even when we're on the road, you know, athletes that typically cook at home, it's easier when you're at home to, to delay the meal or skip a meal or a snack. But it's nice when you have prescribed eating times because a lot of times, and we hear this all the time with guys, is that, you know, they feel like they're eating all the time or, wow, this is a lot of food. And these are in guys where you know that they're sort of under-consuming you know, preseason is a great example. You know, the demands are the highest. So we got to be feeling the most at that time. And it's going to feel for a lot of guys, especially young athletes, high school, college, like they're just really, you know, <laughs> they're constantly full. But but that's what we want to be doing. And, and so the, the cafeteria dining hall could be great for that. Um, but yeah, like you said, then when you're eating off campus or you're getting stuff, then all of a sudden it's easier to, and again, to have processed food. But if, you know, a little bit's this isn't about n never having it. You know what I mean? You got, you got to fill up those buckets in terms of macros and, and energy, but you know, you'll start to see that athletes who have a higher intake of processed foods, that resiliency piece on that human level starts to go down. Right. When we talk about immunity, we see some cool research on, on the, on the gut and the diversity of the gut. You know, it, it tends to be the, the really only reliable thing that we can hang our hat on to talk about health. And of course, that plummets pretty good as well when you're on a, you know, more of a processed food diet. So, you know, the tricky part is always finding out stuff that young adults, kids likes to eat because, you know, that can be a big problem too. I'm not sure how you guys go about that uh, in your program to keep the, you know, keep the variety of food items up. But that's, that's the one to try to, to instill in, in young athletes. Uh, it's mostly begging. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's, that's our secret too. Yeah, it's mostly, it's mostly, yeah, at lunch for a while, it, it was mostly begging. It was a lot of please and thank yous. It was a lot of, come on, you, I, I think you know better. Like, please go get something else. I, uh, yeah, you know, it's maybe I'm just like TLC, man. I just wasn't too proud to beg a little bit to try to get these guys <laughs> to do it. But sometimes you got to do what the game demands, right? Well, that's just it. And, you know, some great work by folks like Susan Michi on, on uh, behavior change and, you know, coercions in there, you know, using things as a, you know, uh, using rewards and, and things like that. So sometimes it's like, well, Hey, eat this. And then you can have that afterwards or get this in first. You know, we want to make sure I think the oftentimes if there's more processed food, we tend to hit calories and carbohydrates pretty easily, but sometimes the protein intake, depending on the sport or the athlete can be, can be compromised a little bit. And so that's one where we can focus more on, on that area. Or even, you know, when we add protein into processed food, we change how that meal is then impacted in terms of a glucose response or the thermic effect of that meal. So those are little tools that you, we kind of throw in there if people are going to be having more processed food to say, hey, make sure you, you get enough protein in that meal to offset it. And if you're going to go get a meal at a fast food place, let's just try to stay off the cola and, and you know, get a few more patties on that burger and at least then we can start to shift the uh, the intake a little bit and cuz you know people want to enjoy food kids are going to be kids so we got to watch we don't just try to restrict everything to get to where we want to go but you know create the environments where they're going to succeed and then also you know a little bit of coercion a little bit of uh you know rewarding is uh is fair game too well that's an interesting point too and one that I guess I really haven't thought of is that the amount of protein in like that burger and fries is really not that much in the grand scheme of it. 
Absolutely. I mean, that's one where, you know, we tend to lump things like steak in with, with burgers and, and sausages. I mean, um, you know, steak's going to have much more protein content by weight than something like a burger. And so even then, again, if you're, if you're going out somewhere like a fast food place and that getting, you know, more patties on there is going to get that protein intake up. If you can, if you, if you do well with things like dairy, you know, having, having some milk, even chocolate milk, if it's sort of, you know, especially post-exercise to get that protein intake up is, is a big one. You know, the nice part now is we tend to see in, in professional sports anyway, especially things like soccer and basketballs that in the nineties, you know, the average intake of protein was around 108 grams, 110 grams for let's say 80, 85 kilo, you know, 180, 190 pound players. Whereas 20 years on of this research telling us about the importance of protein. Now you see the intakes around 180, 200, right? So at the highest level, protein now is actually one where most players are covered. And a lot of that's from supplementation and education. Um, and that's where at the higher levels we can see now, depending on the sport, you know, it can maybe be carbohydrate intake that needs to be shifted around a little bit, um, depending on the player and the sport. But I would say in the younger and the younger athletes, you know, we still see breakfast being the meal of the day where protein is the least highest, right? Um, and I know we've got a lot of young guys who love eggs, but when they go to whatever school it might be, then maybe the eggs, they don't like the powdered eggs or the way the eggs are prepared. And then all of a sudden the breakfast changes quite a bit. Right. And so I think, you know, like all things, it's kind of finding the gaps, you know, you got a player in front of you and you just, if, especially if you're the strength coach or the AT athletic therapist or trainer, you know, and you're, starting you're stretching a player or working with them just asking a few little questions around that you know what's a what's a typical breakfast look like you know try to get a feel for that because then you can figure out some ways of bumping up that protein and you know whether it's adding some yogurt for breakfast whether it's milks even things like soy milk i mean that's that's one that gets a bad rap <laughs> these days on the internet soy does and it's you know pound for pound a heck of a lot better than all the other plant-based proteins um i had dr cody hahn on my podcast last year and he shared a meta-analysis they'd done around the impacts on, you know, estrogen, testosterone, which is the big thing that we've heard about with too much soy and, of course, you know, no effect on any of those things. And so, you know, find, finding the thing that works for that athlete. And then, and I think breakfast is a pretty darn good place to start because lunch and dinner, we tend to see athletes getting that in. So if we can nail breakfast down, then we're doing pretty well to, uh, to get those fundamentals in place. Yeah. And I think, too, that even more so with young people, just getting them to breakfast is a win in the first place. <laughs> yeah. There's also that. You know, because it, it is really, you know, and you touched upon this a little bit with your sleep schedule and stuff, but I think guy, Dr. Singh, on the podcast, it'll be a couple months ago at this point, you know, and I think that the hard part for them with breakfast is the fact that they're just kind of wired to be up later. Whether we like that or not with them, it's kind of how it is. Yeah, so chronotypes become pretty important. And this is where, um, you know, this idea of social jet lag, right? We see a uh, chatted with a, a researcher named uh, Michele Lastella from Australia last year who does works on chronotypes and athletes. And he was talking about how you know, teenagers and adolescents have a later chronotype, right? They're just hardwired to stay up later and sleep in later. And so the social jet lag part of it comes in when basically when we say, hey, class starts at eight or practice starts at eight or nine. And so they're literally having to get up earlier than their bodies want to get up. And so I think that's where, you know, the coach or the strength coach or whomever have got to maybe weigh things around and figure out, okay, well, maybe getting to the dining hall at that time isn't the best strategy for X athlete. Maybe if we get them a shake in their room or some milk in the fridge or whatever it might be, a big, you know, you know, tub of yogurt or whatnot, trying to get to that 20 grams of protein really, um, it would be ideal. And then obviously carbohydrates are easier, you know, pieces of fruit, dried fruit, whatever they want to throw in there. Um, but that's definitely one where, yeah, if all of a sudden we start, the hunger's not there in the morning, we're, we're cutting into sleep time. I think the hardest one for, for students and for even, I guess, trainers at that stage is, are they just staying up too late because they're not going to bed on time? You know, they're having, uh, is that part of why they're tired or are they actually just tired because of that sort of chronotyping? And so I think that's, that's, that's the tricky one. Yeah. So then I guess the question that piggybacks that is, are you attempting to change a behavior 
or are you going to be willing to change because the behavior won't? Yeah, that's again, you know, we see uh, Major League Baseball now with that the you know, changing the start times in spring training, pushing them back later for a lot of the younger players. And so, you know, a circumstance will always determine that context. You know, what's what's the what's the context for that athlete, for that sport, that coach? Um, you know, what are the philosophies they're trying to push forward? I just think it's an important you know, as, as you mentioned, it's it's important to consider because if we're if we're cutting into this and there's and there's no solid reason on why we're getting these kids up earlier and they potentially could sleep longer, then hey, you know that might be, you know that might be the thing around recovery. We know these are long, grueling seasons. It's 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 a marathon, not a sprint. And so, you know, that's where the nutrition really helps you out as the season goes and you get to that last home stretch. And same with the things like sleep. And so, you know, if those can be adjusted, hey, great. If not, then even some tips around you know, sleep and napping, you know, durations of naps and then trying to, to carve those in on the weekends for, for athletes is, can be a big one as well because that comes back on the nutrition front, right? We know if you if you don't sleep enough, it's going to start to queue up cravings around hunger. You see athletes craving more, you know, sugar-based foods. Uh, you see this a lot in endurance athletes, right? They just start craving, you know, walk home and grab a bag of Twizzlers and knock it back and not even sure why they wanted it, right? It just the sugar cravings go through the roof. And so that that incomplete recovery starts to really cue up um, a lot of those hunger hormones. And so that's definitely one to, uh, you know, to, we, we've got to address. And I think that's where getting back to your fundamentals, if we can establish a certain meal frequency and get players used to eating at certain times, um, even if they're not eating exactly what you want, just getting that pattern in is pretty darn important because then that hopefully that pattern can stick throughout the season. And when they get to that February, March time, when the, when it's uh, you know everyone's beat up and then just trying to make it to the finish line, then they're getting still enough fuel on board because they got those habits built in. Yeah, no, and I dig that, man. I think that you know it, it's so cheesy and it's so pun intended, but the low hanging fruit. You know, that we look at, and kind of the battle that I fought was getting them to eat some sort of real protein, some sort of vegetable, and some sort of fruit at lunch. But mm -hmm. really what might have been the biggest thing is that they all ate lunch every day. Yeah, I mean, that's, um, you know, it's it, ideally, that that's really the scenario, yeah, when you look at sort of the... The bigger picture. I mean, I remember chatting with Lachlan Penfold. There works with used to be with the Golden State Warriors, performance director now back in Australia with the Melbourne Storm. There, the rugby team, and he was talking recovery. And you know, I'm like, well, what's but you know, ice baths, hot baths, how much time? You know, I don't care. Whatever, pick whatever they like. If they if they're gonna do it all the time, the consistency is the piece that he's after. And obviously that comes even, you know, the, the real big rocks there in recovery for him were nutrition, sleep, and this kind of mental, emotional stress, you know, making sure and then the training plan, of course. But after that, when you're talking modalities, it was all about consistency. You know, what are they just going to do all the time? And so I think that's a great point around, hey, the first steps, they're showing up for it, you know. Or the first step might be they're having that small breakfast in their dorm room or wherever they're staying. We know they're having it every day. They're getting to the lunchroom. Maybe they're not having exactly what you want, but they're starting to fuel. Um because I think sometimes even around, you know, we're talking about protein now, but, you know, the first the first pillar has got to be total energy, right? How much we're getting in because, you know, whether it's 1.2 grams per kilo all the way up to 2 grams per kilo, you know, the benefits that you might get are, are arguable depending on sport and everything else, right? But the energy demands is a huge one, especially when you're, you're dealing with athletes who are still growing, still maturing, right? That's uh, – and – you know, if they're walking around campus or doing other activities, I mean, that just all adds to the to the need that they have. And so, yeah, huge win if we can just get them showing up. And I think that's where making nutrition or food time, keeping it fun too, right? Like it's a it's a break for athletes. It's a chance to connect with your friends and and have a bit of a mental break from the training, the the weight room, everything else. And so you're going to have your action points that you're trying to get across. But I think the art is in the delivery of it, of trying to make it subtle and and still keeping it light because I think sometimes in its natural that we kind of can almost get too, um, 
don't know what the right term might be, but dog. Some of the fun in the nutrition, because then it becomes another piece of homework that the athlete has to do. Yeah. And it's, uh, and then it just ties in with the whole thing with like monitoring or whatever else we do is it's how many touches are you going to make? And how many touches are these people going to be able to take before they're like, dude, leave me alone. Mm. So I yeah, absolutely. That. Dogmatic's yeah, I think a great word. I think that's, uh, you know, it's becoming sort of sterile as, you know, as well. Yeah, we just, uh, and that's kind of gets back to that European way of when you think of like the San Antonio Spurs and these players going out for these meals and yay, they're drinking red wine and, you know, they're, they're doing these things, but they're getting together. And so that, that, you know, emotional aspect of, of just being able to hang out and, you know, obviously this is more for the adults, but even, even research around alcohol consumption, right? We see that, well, if you don't drink alcohol, you don't really live any longer than if you do drink alcohol. And some studies show health benefits to alcohol, but the, the thing that they can't really tease out is, is typically when you're having a glass of wine, you're having it with all your friends, right? Or if you're having a, a, a bottle of beer, you're having it with friends. And so what's, what's the social dynamic? What's the laughing and the sharing doing for the health? Right, so that becomes tied into the going for coffee or having a having a a, bo- a glass of wine, and so that's not to say that you know, young athletes need to do that, but the social aspect is a really huge part of it. So I like what you mentioned there about hey, everyone shows up for lunch, break bread together, share. If we could do that again a couple times a day, um, that's that's the bigger goal because I think there's going to be a lot of other things that then come out in the wash in those periods. Well, and you know, there's topics about building athlete performance and getting people to reach their highest realms and a pretty awesome resource that you put together too. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you know, there's the fundamentals are what all these elite performance staffs and, you know, people like yourself are doing. And I think, you know, for me researching my book, it was great to be able to connect with a lot of folks and, and, the you know, on the front lines and see what they're doing, because really it is, you know, 80% of it's the fundamentals and being an expert in the fundamentals, right? I mean, we tend to call it the basics, but then we think it's basic, right? Whereas, oh, you know, the things that they're working on, you know, professional golfers still grip, stance, alignment, you know, that's what you learn when you're six, when you first pick up a golf club. And, you know, same, we see the great shooters working on when they come out to practice underneath the net, working on the same, you know, drills and, and things that they did when they first started shooting basketball. And so I think it's this, with nutrition, it becomes, you know, as athletes learn more and get more engaged, I think sometimes it's like, hey, that shiny new toy, what's that supplement over there that's going to give me some gains or what's that thing that can, and and hey, maybe sometimes you want to use those as a bit of a carrot, you know, there's, again, for things even like creatine, you know, the recovery aspect of creatine is massive and i think that's one that gets overshadowed by the constant chatter around what it can do for us on a physical performance which is still terrific um, but i think for a lot of team sport athletes the recovery part can be massive but again if, if an athlete doesn't have their total energy their carbohydrate uh, totals your know, protein intake covered you know that's got to be the first line of the, the first line that we cover right and it's tough when you're only one coach or one trainer and you got a lot of athletes i mean Thankfully, in basketball, there's not as many guys as a football team, but but um, I think like anything, if we can get some of the leaders on the team to adopt certain habits, then all of a sudden it's less about the coach or the trainer having to uh, dictate what's going on and more of the other guys kind of following suit or gals. Yeah, man, totally. And we're going to make sure that we get all the stuff to peak the, the links and all that in the show notes, because it is an exceptional resource. And it's one that I think that people really do need to have their hands on because understanding, you know, those, those pillars is what you build on. Yeah. I mean, if you can keep athletes healthy, if you can fuel them for the demands of their sport, right. If we can, you know, it is written with a nutrition slant. So things like recovery, if we can get those things into place, especially when you get into those compressed schedules when you're playing lots of games and not many days. And then, you know, a big thing for me as well, even, even uh, again, research in the book was around the, just the mindset piece, you know, especially, you know, we got Serena Williams just in the finals recently, obviously 37 years old, greatest tennis player of all time, maybe pretty close. And she's still looking between turn uh, game changes. She's still looking at a notebook with positive affirmations. You know, she's won 24 majors. So if 
you know, if someone like that still needs these fundamentals and, and going over things, I think that, you know, the rest, the rest of us can learn from that as well. And, you know, as you know, social media is, can be great for a lot of things, but for, for kids too, I mean, there's a lot of negative stuff that comes with that. Um, our minds tend to default to negative thoughts as well. And so how do we, how do we harness that? You know, how do we start to control that narrative? And um, it's been fun being able to, to communicate and chat with our sports like uh, Dr. Peter Jensen. He's a you know, phenomenal resource. And, you know, again, we fell short of our goals at the, at the uh, World Cup in China this past month. But, you know, it was amazing to hear him speak around, you know, it's a setback. What does a setback mean? That means you're not there yet. You know, it means you're not ready yet. So you got to go back to the drawing board. You got to work a little more. You know, and when you're ready, you can you can get there. And I think that's a, you know, whether it's on the nutrition front, the training front, whether athletic goals people have, I think that's a good thing to 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 always come back to, right? Because, you know, it's like you're either there or you're not there yet. If you're not there yet, you got to keep putting the work in, right? I don't think it could have been said any better way, Doc. It, it, this is absolutely awesome stuff. I truly appreciate your time and all you're doing to help coaches be better, Doc. Thank you so much. Uh, people are going to love this. Amazing. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Cheers. Thank you so much. We'll be in touch real soon. Awesome. Thanks, bud. Thanks. And a huge thank you to Canada Basketball's Dr. Mark Bubbs for spending the time with us today. Guys, just some open, honest candid sharing and some really, really huge take-home nuggets when it comes to meal timing, consistency, and some different strategies that we can use when we're looking at, you know, where the athletes may not be making the best choices and how we can help them improve the decisions that they make at those places that might not be the best choices. I can't thank Dr. Bubs enough for spending the time with us today and being so open, honest, and candid with his sharing today. And guys, make sure you hit the link in the bio to grab yourself a copy of Peak, the new science of athletic performance. Um, in all seriousness, I'm getting no kickback at all from this. I bought a copy myself. I think the book's awesome. I think that we should, uh, this should be something that coaches have in their library because there is a ton of awesome, useful information in there. So, Dr. Bubs, thank you so much for the time that it took to put that together. I, I can't even imagine how long the research project was was to put this book together. So, thank you so much for that. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy the talk, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. As always, we are just trying to put the best information out there to all the great coaches that we can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.